kinds of people from all castes and all classes of society, just like that, came into the Buddha's presence, or after some time, as it expanded, the presence of one, of one, or, two, one or two of his enlightened disciples, stopped what they were doing, and, depending on their circumstances, attained some level of cognitive disruption, you could call it, or transformation, and adopted the mendicant lifestyle. Warriors, merchants, Brahmin priests, even those who had gone out to be ascetics in the forest, they all joined up in great numbers. As the numbers increased, of course, society also felt the disruption, and certain problems gradually emerged. The king of Magadha, Bimbisara, who was a strong supporter by instinct of the Buddha, requested the Buddha to issue a set of rules for the Sangha community, in parallel with other communities that were forming from under other teachers at the time. At first, the Buddha refused to do so, saying rules would only emerge as precedents were set, as specific situations called for judgment about this or that problem or behavior. There must have been some economic pressure, too, from the society, as they suddenly had lots of people embracing professional homelessness and seeking alms for food, that is, free lunches, which is what bhikshu or mendicant actually means. In the Western translations that you read, as you study in the course, this is often translated as a monk, because the mendicants also eventually had vows of celibacy, nonviolence, poverty, and non-lying, you know, truthfulness, and so on, like Western Christian monks and nuns. But uh, the monk comes along with sort of Western uh, monastic connotations that the mendicants don't really have. Um, although, in a way, you could say eventually they do later after many centuries, but for the time they don't. So always think mendicant when you see monk when you're reading Buddhist texts in English translation. There were a few orders of ascetics at that time, uh, people who went off into the forest to seek uh, higher cognition and higher awareness, but none that appealed to people and accepted people from all castes and all occupations, and none of whom accepted women. Only the upper class people usually, like either a few warriors, but mostly the high priests would go there. The caste system under the Vedic culture, sanctified by the gods and their Vedic scriptures, excluded the majority of working people. who were They weren't slaves, but they were kept on a very low rung of society, and they were not allowed into the, they were outcasts in the sense of not allowed into the Vedic temples or the sacrificial ceremonies. The very word for caste, actually, Sanskrit varna, means color. And so there already was a color barrier derived from the lighter-skinned so-called Aryans who came from Central Asia gradually over a millennium and looking down on the local Indus Valley villagers who were descended from the long preceding uh, but gradually overwhelmed Harappan civilization in the Indus Valley. Now the Buddha's movement uh, expanded the opportunity for personal liberation, and even education, for a majority of these underclass or outcast individuals, and even for women, which was more revolutionary, as well as attracting individualistic members from the elite ruler, priestly, and merchant classes, such as Buddha himself, Siddhartha himself, you know. As the numbers of mendicants began to increase exponentially, all attracted by the promise and often quick result of greater inner and outer happiness. The Buddha was very careful in organizing the new community not to overstrain the tolerance of the society. That was why at first he resisted female mendicants, because he knew that the women would come in great numbers and the, the, the patriarchal families would resist it. Uh, he also uh, limited the need for food you know, for this free lunch by restricting everyone, himself included, only to lunch, one meal a day. It actually was a brunch that had to be completed before noon. And he forbade any mendicant from getting, receiving food, even if freely offered, for the day, next day. They had to go back every day and get that fresh food, fresh lunch to avoid them accumulating, starting to accumulate food supplies. 
He also avoided economic and status competition with the all-important Brahmin priest caste, forbidding the mendicants from performing birth ceremonies, you know, naming ceremonies, marriage ceremonies, funerals, or any kind of divination rites if they had kind of a higher perception of things. This, these were the livelihood uh, rituals that the priests did already, and he didn't want his, monk, his mendicants in competing with that. Also, the status of the members of the new Sangha community in the Sangha community depended only on seniority whenever they entered as a mendicant. And judged by when they graduated, and the word is not ordination, like in Western monasticism, it's graduation, and the idea is that you graduate from being in habitual, preoccupied, worldly life, you know, livelihood, family, duty, etc. You graduate from that into this realm of relative freedom, of just getting free food, not having to do livelihood work, spending your whole time in study, education, and self-development, self-transformation. So you entered into this lifestyle that was an escape from being the homebound lay person and into the privileged homelessness of the mendicant. So, so that meant that formerly lower caste or even outcast persons, once in the community, they were senior and they were superior to the, in the community to the upper caste members who came in later, which was sometimes a little bit of a shock to the upper caste ones, but it was good for their egotism, let's call it.